Would you pour down my grave and wash in my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know that you're in this place. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness. Word of God, speak. Finding myself in the midst of you Beyond the music, beyond the noise And all that I need is to be with you And in the quiet, I hear your voice The word of God speaks would you pour down like rain to wash in my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know that you're in this place please let me stay and rest in your holy hands the word of God speak would you pour down like rain in my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know that you're in this place please let me stay and rest in your holiness finding myself at a loss for words and the funny thing is that it's okay. Thank you, Scott. Happy New Year. Oh, are you guys awake yet? Let's try it. Happy New Year. All right, now it sounds a little bit more like a happy new year. So I hope it's uh, going well so far and look forward to a great, uh, great year in 2015. But we're glad that you've uh, chosen to come and worship with us. And just uh, for the record that all of you so far that are here have perfect attendance for the year. Yay! So let's keep it up next week. And uh, let, let's just take it week by week. So, But uh, we uh, do ask that you take a card from the seat in front of you and please fill that out. And uh, people ask uh, quite a bit, you know, do I need to fill it out each week? And I say yes. Um, we do. I go through the cards each week. Um, we do track the attendance of our members. Um, not that you're going to get kicked out if you're not here enough, but um, we, we, it's a way that we can make sure if you're missing, um, you know that we missed you. And so we do look through those. If you're visiting, we'd like you to fill those out too so that we know that you're here. But we do go through those each week. So we, we do ask that everybody fill those, fills those out each week. If you don't fill it out, um, sometimes, you know, I see you guys and, you know, we're, we're good. But at some point, you're probably going to get a letter from us saying, you haven't filled a card out for a while. And you go, well, I've been there every week for 20 years. And say, you haven't filled a card out. So um, fill those out, and that, that just helps us keep track of everybody. A uh, couple things we want to mention is that um, in the auditorium before the service sometime when they were picking stuff up, they found the key. So if you're missing the key or would like a key to somebody's house or something, um, <laughs> come see me and it's going off to the highest bidder. No, uh, it, it'll be in on uh, Debbie's desk. Um, they found it here in the auditorium, so i um, not sure if it was someone first service Sunday school or what, but if you're missing the key, here it is. Uh, also, the poinsettias that are here, um, if you would like one after the service, Feel free to take one. Uh, there's some of the extra ones we have, so if you can use them. <coughs> uh, also, today, we've got several things uh, taking place. Uh, at 2 o'clock, uh, Kim King is going to be having her swearing-in service uh, here today, and the Lee Watts, the Kentucky General Assembly Chaplain, will be uh, bringing a message, but I invite you back to share in that swearing-in service for Kim. Uh, also, at 6 o'clock tonight, uh, I'll be having a 101 class and that's a class that if you've been visiting the church, uh, would like to find out 
uh, what we believe, how to be a member. Uh, we'll be meeting in the back room to my left, your right. And so I uh, um, hope that you'll, uh, if you have questions, you'll come to that. Uh, youth group at 6.30. And then at 7 o'clock, uh, the elders will be here for the evening service, uh, sharing an update on our building program and where they're at in the process, what they're thinking, um, getting some input from the congregation on what, what thoughts you think in the, in the next building program. So plan to be here for se at 7 for that. Uh, children's choir will not start back up until uh, February 1st. So there will not be anything for the children tonight. Um, but make sure to look through the bulletin, uh, see the other things that are in there. Uh, the other thing that we ask is that uh, some of our shut-ins, we take them to bulletins each week. And, um, you know, that little outline in the middle is really helpful if you're here to service because you can fill in the blanks. Um, when they hand it to the shut-ins, they look at it and they only get like half the sermon without the main points. So they've requested that if they could get some that are filled out. So um, if you could um, fill those out during the service and if it's not one that you write your notes on and, and want to take home with you, if you would like to fill that in for the shut-ins, please leave it on the Welcome Center after the service. And as they take communion to them and visit with them this week, they'll take those, and they've been really appreciating that. So um, I think that's all we have right now. Um, we've come to worship today, so let's have the worship team come on up. Let's all stand, and we'll open with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, it's uh, wonderful to have a new year and uh, that we uh, see it as a time of fresh beginnings. And I'm so thankful that um, we're able to meet together in your house to uh, start this new year off uh, in a way of worshiping you. We ask your blessing upon the year. We ask your blessing upon this service. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Y'all are looking especially good today. How, uh, raise your hand if you're wearing Christmas clothes today. Anybody got stuff on you got for Christmas? There's like five of us. All right, good. I say I'm just redneck enough. If you give me something, I'm going to wear it the next day. I mean, because it's added to the repertoire. But you're looking especially good today. Let's worship the Lord together this morning. If you feel like clapping, clap along with this one. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Send up a big hand clap of praise this morning in his house. Amen. Hey, we want to give you a few moments to greet those around you. Make sure everybody, look for new faces. Make sure everybody knows how welcome they are here. Right, if you would just remain standing I don't know if you all have noticed in the checkout lanes uh, as you go through at Walmart or the grocery store but all those little reputable magazines like the National Enquirer and so forth this time of year they they usually have a common theme have you noticed what what tends to pop up in those magazines stuff about the end of time 
You ever notice? Is this the year that the world will end? 2015. When I was a kid, that totally freaked me out thinking about that. I'd go to church, and I was like, oh, the preacher's preaching about that today, and it wigged me out. I don't know about you, but the older I've gotten and the more I've learned about how it all unfolds, I'm looking forward to it now. And I'm like, today I'm like, Lord, if this is the year, let's do this. Let's do it. And uh, so I hope that you're there. And if not, you just keep studying the Word because it ends well for us. It gets rough between now and then, but we win in the end. Gerald, I watched the replay of that game, and just knowing how it came out, I was completely miserable when it was live. But I watched the replay, thoroughly enjoyed it uh, the second time around. And we know how this story ends. Amen? And so we have all the reason to celebrate today as we think about the days of Elijah. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword, but still in the desert crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, He comes, striding on the clouds, shining like the sun, and the trumpet call in your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, and God is dying to salvation. Serving David, rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest. The fields are as wide in the world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, he's riding. today. That fires me up. <laughs> Amen. You may be seated. You know, uh, for some, 2014 was, uh, was a great year, and I've, you know, I, I get on Facebook and watch things on Facebook, and, uh, and some people reflected on 2014 at all the joys and the successes of the past year, but I also saw people lamenting that 2014 was a, a rough year, and it was for for many people as well. Uh, 2015, we don't know yet what it's going to hold. But I do know one thing, that whether it's a mountaintop or whether it's filled with valleys, that either way, I need the Lord. Amen? 
And uh, there's times when we're more aware of our need for the Lord than others. But maybe especially when you're on that mountaintop. And if you can't handle the mountaintop, uh, you're going to realize pretty quickly how you need the Lord. I love this next song because it expresses uh, directly something that all of us need to acknowledge. Is that on the mountaintops or in the valleys or whether you're somewhere in between right now, every hour of every day, we need the Lord. Lord, I Father, we've come today to declare that truth that, Lord, you are our everything. You're our creator. We literally would not even exist without you. But, Lord, even more than that, you're our sustainer. 
Father, forgive us for the times that we've tried to sustain ourselves. The times that we have thought arrogantly, Lord, that we've got this, that we've got this all figured out and have charted our own course through this life, ignoring you and your wisdom that calls out through your, your word of truth. Father, many of us have learned the hard way that that doesn't always work. Father, we come today willingly to say that we need you. We need your wisdom to guide us through the valleys of life. Lord, we need your wisdom to help us stand on the mountaintops without building false sense of pride or self-sufficiency, Lord. But Father, in both cases, mountaintops and valleys and the places in between, help us to realize that we need you. And to come today, as we do in gathering around your table today, to declare that we need you for eternal life. We can't be good enough on our own. Uh, we haven't done enough to offset the bad or all the other philosophies of this day, Lord. We just need you. We need Jesus Christ for his blood to atone for our sins, for your Holy Spirit to come and to do within us what we can't do on our own. And, Father, for strength to face each day, one day at a time, we, we need you. So in these next few moments, Lord, we just declare our dependence upon you. But, Father, at the same time, thank you for the confidence that you give us by telling us that greater is he that is in us than he that's in this world. And if, if we truly have you in our lives, there's nothing of this world, no person of this world that can, can touch us and take what we have within us. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit and your all-sufficiency. We have everything that we need. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today, as, as we head into a time of, of communion, we invite you to come and bring all of your sins, your hang-ups, and all those things that maybe you've thought about this time of year, especially as we think about resolutions and changes we want to make. Bring all that junk, and, and let's bring it to the Lord's table, and let's confess it, and just own who we are, and lay it down, but also be assured that His blood washes us clean. He wants to, us to enter 2015 and enter the rest of this day with the assurance that he wants to place his spirit and make us right on the inside out so that we can live with confidence of who he is in us. Uh, these next few moments, we're, this is open to all baptized believers in Christ as we celebrate what we have through Jesus Christ today through the emblems of his, of his body. Let's, let's enter into communion together. you clothed yourself in frail humanity and you did not wait for me to cry out to you but you let me hear your voice calling me and I'm forever grateful to you and I'm forever grateful Father, we, uh, we are grateful this morning that you gave your, uh, 
your son Jesus to die on the cross for us that, uh, to do what we could not do Father Lord we love you for that and, and I pray Lord that then that our only response to that would be to live a life of humility and love compassion for others and Lord to love you with a full heart by showing our gratitude Lord when you're grateful for something you show and we thank you God for all that you do for us Lord, may we put aside the cares of the world just now and pay homage to the one that paved the way for us. And Lord, uh, we have so much to be grateful for. And Lord, as we go through another year, I pray we'd do it with the recognition that uh, we've been given so much. And I pray that we would show by our very lives, God, that we do appreciate that. So Father, be with us. Protect us, keep us safe in all that we do. And as we put aside the cares of the world for a few moments, Father, we do thank you and we love you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus met with his disciples that night before he would uh, go to the cross and die a cruel death on our behalf. He took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body. And in like manner, he took the cup saying, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is given for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you this time we've come together and worship in your house. But please be with Brother Greg as he brings us your message. Watch over us, keep us safe, and uh, please bless this offering for the kingdom of your here on earth. All these things we ask in your precious heavenly name. Amen. Somebody's praying, but I can feel it. Somebody's praying for me. Mighty hands are guiding me to protect me from what I can't see. Lord, I believe. Lord, Somebody's praying for me. Angels are watching, but I can feel it. Your angels are watching over me. There's many miles ahead till I get home. Still I'm safely kept before your throne. Cause Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Your angels are watching over me. I've walked the barren wilderness For my pillow was a stone And I went through the darkest caverns Where no light has ever shone Still I went on Cause there was someone Who was down on their knees And Lord, I thank you for those people Praying all this time for me. Somebody's praying, and I can feel it. Somebody's praying for me. Mighty hands are guiding me to protect me from what I can't see. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Somebody's praying for me. Somebody's praying. For me.
you all are here today because somebody prayed you through uh, through in your life. Amen. Those uh, prayer angels are, are very important in our lives. If you have your bulletins, I encourage you to turn to the center of those, and you'll find an outline there that might help you follow along today and encourage you to fill it in as we go. Um, if you have your Bible, I encourage you to turn with me to John chapter 13. Um, and before I get into the message, if I can make a little public service announcement here today, uh, I hope that you'll make it a habit uh, in the coming year to bring your Bible uh, to church with you each week. And I know that uh, we live in a new tech day, and, and some people, and I do this sometimes too, I'll just uh, get my phone app, and those are awesome, they're handy, you know, you always got a Bible with you everywhere you go, and those are fine, I'm not saying anything's wrong with that. Some people just watch the scriptures as we bring them up on the screen, but I've got this old school preference, I guess, that there's nothing refreshing for me as a preacher as we open the Word together just to see Bibles out on everybody's laps and hear those pages turning and and I love a, a well-marked Bible as we uh, go through the Word of God together. So I encourage you to, to do that. Maybe you've never done it before. Give it a try, and I think you'll find it refreshing. But while I'm old school in some ways, I also want to talk to you about a, a new school way of, of getting the most out of our time in the Word together each week. Uh, like most things, the Internet, it has uh, its evils, and there, you can get into a lot of trouble quick on the Internet and lots of... Uh, bad things take place on the internet, but it's also, like most things, a great tool that can be used for good, and you find what you're looking for in it. Um, I invite you to find us on Facebook, to find our church on Facebook. Now, some of you <laughs> are old school, and you're like, what is Facebook? Then I'm not going to take the time here to explain it all. Just get somebody to explain it. Find your grandkids. They can tell you what, what it is if you don't know. But if you do know what Facebook is, find us. Do a little search for the Carpenters Christian Church. If you'll send a request to be a member of it, uh, I'm pretty sure I'll approve you and, and let, you, let you in. But uh, we're using that as a tool to kind of let you know leading up to it. You know, this week, if you were on there, I put the scripture that I was going to be sharing today on there. There was a video that, uh, from the scene, the Gospel of John, that kind of uh, portrayed the, the scripture today. I'll try to put up different things that I think might be useful to you as we're preparing our hearts to, to be in the Word together. Um, I put some links up there, open up things for us to discuss and kind of share ideas, takeaways from things that we're talking about, offer prayer requests. It's a great way for us to stay in touch as a church family, so I encourage you to check that out. Um, with that said, would you join me for a word of prayer before we get into the Word? God, we thank you today for your Word. God, it's perfect. It's not lacking in anything. Father, this is more than just any other book. This, this book has the power to change us because it's living and it's active. Lord, you tell us that your word will never return void. And so I'm trusting that today. I pray that your Holy Spirit will use this word as it's preached to get me out of the way, Lord. Don't ever let this be about me. But let your word be heard today. Let your truth permeate our hearts and, and to the very soul. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In John 13, if you have your Bibles, I want to talk with you a little bit today about the highest form of love. And starting with verse 1, we read this. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And there's a reason that that last part uh, I guess I underlined it in, 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 uh, in the scripture I shared for you. But as we reach the end of this gospel, uh, Jesus slow, or the, the, the scriptures slow down. John slows down the pace with which he's telling the story of Jesus. The first four chapters, the first 12 chapters, rather, that we've been through tell us about the first three years of Jesus' ministry. So we kind of go fast and furious. In 12 chapters, we cover three years of Jesus' life and ministry. But the final six chapters of John, it's going to slow down because everything has been leading up to this. Everything that Jesus came for is about to happen. And so it takes the last uh, six chapters to cover the events of the last three days of Jesus' life. And as Passover approaches, Jesus knows that the time of his death has come. And so you get the sense that he's more purposeful, even more purposeful than usual, about everything that he says, every opportunity that he has to teach the disciples important lessons before his death. 
And so at first reading, we probably take that part of the verse that, that's underlined to mean that he loved them all the way to the end of his life. That's the way I took it the first time I read it. But as I've studied it this week, I realized that the Greek phrase that's actually used here suggests that it means that he loved them to the end, the full capacity of what you're capable of loving someone. So instead of the glass being only this full, he loved them to the full capacity of what he was capable of loving them with. And then after saying this, Jesus then modeled humility and selfishness. Now, I'm not a real smart guy. But I can kind of put this together that Jesus was telling us that if we are really intentional about wanting to love someone to the fullest capacity, that we need to learn what he's teaching next. Something about humility and selflessness. So I, I believe that he was teaching us about just that, humility and, and selflessness. Now this has really affected me this week as I've been spending time in, in this, this chapter because the Holy Spirit has convicted me. If nobody else gets anything out of this this week, I have. Because one of the things the Holy Spirit has made me aware of is that I'm more selfish than I realized. If you had asked me before, are you a selfish person? I said, well, you know, I have my moments when I probably am. But overall, I, I'm, I'm a fairly humble person. And uh, matter of fact, I'm the most humble person in here. <laughs> I don't think that's true. And if I did think that, that would be a disqualifier, wouldn't it? But Certainly this week, God has kind of shown me areas of my life where I'm not as humble as I thought that I might be. Guys, we tell our wives that we love them. But I believe there's a higher degree of love that most of us have never even realized existed, much less tapped into. We haven't really loved our wives. We haven't really loved our children, our parents, or our friends until we learn the lessons that I want us to look at together today. The essence of the truest form of love, it's rooted in humility of all things. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the Apostle Paul tells us that true love, one of the qualities he says is it's not self-seeking. You've got to, to check that part of your life if you really want to love somebody. In fact, if I had to sum up all of 1 Corinthians 13, which is often known as the love chapter, you could sum it up by saying, if you want to learn how to love, Learn humility. Learn how to be humble and selfless. Now, many of us, I think, have settled for a lesser degree of love. And I think more people than not have settled for a lesser degree of love in our marriages, in our parent-child relationships, in our friendships, in our church acquaintances, and we call ourselves a family. But I think we have settled for a lesser degree of love. Because of what the world says is ordinary love today says, if you do this for me, then, then I'll do this for you. Our world today, whether we consciously realize it or not, we allow and we accept as normal a conditional kind of love. I'll treat you a certain way as long as you behave a certain way. Now, we might not come right out and say that or consciously think that, but our actions reflect that. As long as, as you're meeting my needs, I'm going to treat you fine. But, but if you uh, slack up on your end, then you're going to see a different me. And I'm going to treat you in a different way. I'll do acts of service for you as long as those acts are appreciated. And as long as I'm recognized and, and rewarded for doing those things. But if I feel like I'm taken for granted for a second, I'm going to stop. Because what, what's in it for me? We settle for that kind of love in our daily relationships. And truthfully, I just want to be honest with you, marriages can survive. They can make it on mediocre love. Many of you could tell all too well that marriages can survive on that kind of love. Children can grow up in fairly well-adjusted homes if they can receive even mediocre love and affection from their parents. You can have decent friendships based upon mediocre love. But I guess what I'm saying is today, I've come to share a message with somebody that might be here today saying, you know what, I'm, I'm not willing to settle for mediocre love. I want to understand what Jesus was talking about when he talked about loving them to the fullest degree possible. I think that there are depths in marriage and in human relationships that we can, can, can wade into maybe for the first time if we'll just open our minds and hearts to what Jesus is teaching today. So if you might be that person, let's 
Let's look at what Jesus taught. Secret one of the, of the deepest love is to change how you view yourself. In verses 2 through 4, it says, During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper, and he laid aside his garments. And taking a towel, he girded himself. Now, if we want to learn the first secret to the highest form of love we could offer someone, we've got to be willing to set aside our entitlements for the sake of others. Now, what do I mean by that? We live in a society that has an entitlement problem. An entitlement mentality that is so pervasive that we have come to think of it as, as normal. And probably it's affected your thinking more than you even realize today. Entitlements are things that we feel we deserve or are just owed in life because we are. We're entitled to these things. We feel that the government owes us something. Did you know that the amount of money spent on government subsidized entitlements is at a historic all-time high? The things that we expect our government to provide for us, to ensure that we have, whether it's material things or whether it's, I'm not going to go into the whole political thing today, but you know what I'm talking about. It's at an all-time high, and we feel that we expect these things and we deserve them. Many children today feel that their parents owe them something. I hear many parents lament that their children just expect things that aren't necessities. They're privileges. They are rights above and beyond. But children today have come to expect them. To where if they don't have the latest of this, that, and the other, and the name brand of everything else, well, they, they're ready to call social services that they're being neglected because they're entitled to these things. Our, our grown kids grow up and they expect to start out in life the way that their parents were living at the end of their life's journey because they're entitled to live that way from the get-go. Many married people today feel that their spouse owes them something. When you talk to couples who are having marital problems, if you, if you listen, the normal pattern is for each of us to be focused on what the other is not doing for us. We feel that we're entitled to certain things, and our love in return is often conditional upon what we're not receiving. But Jesus taught us that the first thing we've got to do if we want to truly love others is to get over ourselves. To get over ourselves. If anyone had a right to feel entitled, it was Jesus. God the Father had put all things under his power. Now that looks pretty good on a resume. What are, what's your qualifications for this job? Well, God has put all things under my power. Okay, I think you're qualified. You can do this. Jesus could only, he was the only one that could make this claim. He had already humbled himself in an incredible way merely by leaving the riches of heaven and agreeing to come to earth and put on flesh and be one of us. That was humbling enough. Then he went to a cross to die for us. Philippians chapter 2 says this, Do nothing from selfishness. Or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now verse 4 notes that Jesus laid aside his garments. Don't miss the significance of that. By removing his outer garment, Jesus was casting off the appearance of one who we would associate with nobility. One who we might associate as being entitled to something. There was a difference in the way people dressed according to their rank in society. Instead, he took off his outer garments that implied entitlement. And he merely wrapped himself with a towel, we would call it. Looking in, in all aspects as a servant they typically saw in that day. If you want to learn how to truly love others Jesus taught us you got to get over yourself first learn to quit looking at others merely in terms of what they can do for you 
but start thinking in life and looking through a different lens and thinking of how you can bless others. Get over yourself. Secret two, actions speak louder than words. Verse 5 says, Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Now, foot washing was a common thing in the society of Jesus' day. People traveled mostly on foot across dusty roads in a desert environment. And when you got to someone's house, your feet were nasty. Or as my wife would say it, nasty. Uh, when it's really dirty, it's nasty. It's beyond just nasty. And when you got there, it was common for your feet to need to be washed before you just walked into someone's home. Now today, in our context, we might take our shoes off. If we're going into somebody's house, especially if they've got new carpet or they're clean freaks, you know, you're going to take your shoes off just as a sign of courtesy before you go in and carry in all that outside stuff onto their flooring, whatever it might be. But they would often have wash someone's feet as a sign of honor and politeness, and, but they would usually have a servant do it. Because this was a menial task. This wasn't like somebody was going, oh, I want to wash their nasty feet and scrub between their toes. Can I do that? That was a task assigned to someone lower down the level. But by washing the disciples' feet himself, Jesus was demonstrating the power of humble love in action. And in our culture today of entitlement, of consumerism, I'm going to go and see if there's anything in this for me. But if not, I'm out of here. In our day of, of what's in it for me, of demonstrations of humble love like this, where we look at something and we say, what can I do to be a blessing to somebody else? That stands out like a healthy thumb in a world of consumerism. You know, if you look close enough, though, you can still find it alive and well today. I've thought a lot about this this week, and I'm so proud of so many of you that still have that servant's heart. I see it here in our church. And I look in places like the, the nursery where there are volunteers that have maybe felt uh, uh, fooled with their own kids all week long, but then they come and they give of their time to watch other people's kids so that we can come in and focus on worship and hearing from the Lord. And they give of themselves with a servant's heart. I see it on display when I observe caregivers in our church selflessly caring for a a spouse, a parent, or another family member who needs them. They don't get paid. They don't have parades held in their honor. But they do it faithfully with a servant's heart. I see it on display when we pack shoe boxes and we, we send them to children that we probably will never meet to make sure that they have something to open on Christmas and that they know what the love of Jesus is all about. I see it on display when we serve meals and we donate items and we build relationships with people purposefully that we might not ever come into contact with otherwise. I still see it on display when a number of you give of your time to assist or care for people who you know can't give you anything in return. But you give anyway. It's not dead. It's still alive today. You just got to look for it a little harder maybe than you used to. The third principle I want to share with you is that we, we earn the right to lead by serving. During the American Revolution, a man in civilian clothes rode past a group of soldiers who were repairing a small defensive barrier. Their leader was shouting instructions, but he made no attempt to get down from his horse and, and to go help them. And as the man in civilian clothes went by, he asked the leader, he says, why, why, are, you not, why are you not helping them? He says, sir, I am a corporal. Well, the stranger apologized and dismounted, and he got down to help the exhausted soldiers himself. After the job was done, he, he turned to the corporal, and he said, Mr. Corporal, next time you have a job like this and there's not enough men to do it, come to your commander-in-chief, and I'll be glad to help you again. That man was none other than George Washington himself, who history tells his men would fight for him to the very death. Because they respected him because he led by example. Earlier the disciples had been arguing over which of them would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. They jockeyed for position around the table whenever they would have gatherings like this to see who would have the most status and get to sit the closest to Jesus. And they argued about and when his kingdom came who would be the greatest and who would have the highest status. But Jesus knew what they were thinking. 
And I think that's why he was purposeful in his final days of life here on earth to teach them this lesson. In John 13, we read on down in verses 12 through 17. When he had finished washing their feet, he put, he put on his clothes and he returned to his place. And he said, do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them, you call me teacher and Lord, and, and rightly so, for that's what I am. But now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. He didn't just say, they'll be blessed if you serve them. He said, you'll be blessed if you serve in this way. Leadership is not something that we lord over others, or it shouldn't be. Rather, you start with the most menial of tasks, and you blaze the way yourself, and then you encourage others to do likewise. You don't guilt or intimidate other people into doing the right thing, but you consistently do it yourself, parents, and you model it by example. You don't nag other people into doing what you wish they would do, but you selflessly serve until they see your example and they desire to reciprocate it. Now, does it always happen just nice, neat, and perfectly? No. There are some people that still do not see it, and it does not move them to reciprocate. But remember, we're over ourselves. We're going to do it anyway. We're going to do it anyway. You don't walk into a family, a business, or a team and demand respect. You earn respect by becoming a servant of all. Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Most people will go out of their way to follow that kind of leader. Guys, most wives will have no problem submitting to that kind of leadership in the home. We can talk about how the Bible commands us to uh, wives to submit to their husbands and women get all toward, what do you mean submit? I have never yet met a couple who the, where the husband led the home in this way through servant leadership and found a wife who had a problem submitting to him. I've never seen it because he understands the fullest extent of how to love his wife. Bosses, most employees will gladly work hard for a boss that leads in this fashion. That doesn't just sit in an office and tell those that work under him or her what should be done or how to do it. But is out on the front lines rolling up their sleeves and leading by example and being a team player. And asking if anyone will work with them instead of just under them. Parents. Most children will honor parents willingly. Who love them and lead by example. Who don't just say do as I say. But they don't have to say a lot because their children do as they do. They see it modeled every day. They get a chance that when the parents do miss the mark and get it wrong, they see how their parents respond in coming before the Lord and asking forgiveness and then apologizing to those affected and saying, I want to get it right. There's something pure and honest about that example. And you want to follow somebody like that. Maybe, maybe today you've got a relationship that is, is broken into need of repair. Maybe it, it's a marriage relationship. Maybe it's a, a problem in your, in your work that there's a problem between management and, and those on the front lines. And maybe it's a, a parent-child relationship, whatever it might be. The place to begin the healing is to go back to the basics of what Jesus taught us here about the way to love and to get on your knees and become a servant leader. Take out the towel and the wash basin and simply begin serving. Start from the beginning. Let your frequent and consistent actions speak instead of your words. After weeks and months, listen, I'm not talking about one or two isolated times. I'm talking about committing to this for the long haul, for weeks and for months and sometimes into years. I'm going to serve as a servant, not as one who is entitled, but I am willing to drop to my knees and to wash feet. To serve and to earn the respect. The best place to lead is from your knees. Now today with that said, I want to shift focus just a minute as we conclude today. And I want to talk about the importance of being washed. In verses 6 through 8, 
It says, when Jesus came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Now, Peter, as he often did, he meant well. He just didn't see the big picture. And he thought, there's no way I'm going to let the master wash my feet. I don't want to disrespect him in that way. But as usual, Jesus was trying to teach Peter something spiritual. And there was a bigger picture to be understood here. He goes on and says in verse 8 to Peter, he says, Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you shall have no part of me. And don't miss the final point that, that Jesus also intended this washing of the disciples' feet, not only to teach them about humility and service, but also it was a picture of what he was about to do for them on the cross. His death on the cross would provide the ultimate cleansing. The dirt on the disciples' feet was representative of their sins. They might wash them off and deal with them for a day, but they were going to be dirty again the very next day. But the water that he used to wash them was representative of his blood that was going to be poured out on the cross. Peter then seemed to understand the importance of being washed by Jesus because he says down in verses 9 through 11, Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Now, I've learned not to take things for granted because there are people from all different levels of spiritual maturity here today. So let me get very basic for a minute, okay? What does it mean to be washed by Jesus? First of all, if you want to be washed by Jesus, you need to profess him as Lord and invite him to be the Lord of your life. Now, I'm not going to stand here today and ask you to repeat words after me because that doesn't have meaning if you just mouth words with me. But in your own way, in your own heart, there needs to be a point in time in your life where you call out to God and say, I cannot be clean on my own. I can't be good on my own, but I profess you as the Lord, the Messiah, and I need you. I invite you to come and be the Lord of my life. Now, making him Lord implies the second thing, which means we are willing to repent of our sins. Repentance, I used to think it meant you got emotional sometime and, and you just, that's when you go down front. It's when you start crying, that's the day you get saved. But repentance is a decision that we make that God, it's not about my plans. I repent. I'm tired of fighting against you. I'm tired of thinking I'm smarter than you are, that my path is better, and I repent of that. I want to turn, and now I, I want to strive with all that's within me to live in harmony. I'm turning and I'm tired of fighting the current. I want to turn and live my life with the current of your will and to agree with you that sin is bad in my life and strive for holiness. Now, you'll still need grace. You'll still fail along the way. But those of you who've done this, you understand there's a complete difference between fighting God's will and living in harmony with God's will. And thirdly, he asks that we be baptized. God has given us a beautiful ritual to mark our passage from spiritual death to spiritual life. Acts 2.38, Peter says, Repent, each of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not coincidence, I don't think, that, that God uses water. And he asks that we be washed in water to symbolize this cleansing that Jesus gives us. 1 Peter 3 says, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It comes back to the water. Jesus also explained that there is a difference, final point. There's a difference between that initial cleansing that brings salvation and the ongoing cleansing that maintains a right relationship. In, in verses 10 and 11, Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet, and their whole body is clean. And you're clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him, and that's why he said not everyone was clean. Now, in this analogy, taking a bath is like coming to Jesus for the first time for salvation. And we all need to do that at some point in our life and do these things, profess him and repent and be baptized, the things that we talked about. But I often uh, see this as, as having your feet washed is symbolic of, of that attitude of repentance that we carry with us the rest of our lives. I often get this question from people. They say, Greg, I was baptized years ago, but over time, I, I've gotten away from what I know is right, and I feel convicted about that. 
and I know that things need to change in my life, should I be rebaptized? And my response is always along these lines. We do practice rebaptism here because there are times when we look back at our baptism and we think, you know, I did that for the wrong reasons. I don't even remember doing that. Uh, maybe I was at camp and everybody was being baptized and I did it or I just thought it was a novel thing to do and uh, I was a certain age so I thought well I'll be baptized but I didn't really have an appreciation listen there's nothing magical about the water itself without the inward commitment of your heart and so I do believe it's important for our inward intent of our heart to match the act of baptism itself but then there are also people who who knew what they were doing who made that commitment to Christ but somewhere along their life's journey, they just kind of got lukewarm in their faith. And it wasn't that important to them. And they kind of strayed. And we, sometimes we call it backsliding in their lives. And, and they just kind of drifted spiritually. And then they reached a point of conviction where the Holy Spirit brought them back to where they needed to be all along. And in that case, I think God's grace reaches that person. You don't necessarily have to be rebaptized. You just come back to the original commitment that you made. And so I hope that that helps some of you, because I know that that's, that's asked frequently around here. And some of you, if you pray about it and you feel the Lord is saying, I want to mark this new beginning, I want to be rebaptized, and I want to pledge this commitment as if for the first time, then that's something we'll do. There's, the scripture does not say that we can't do that. But also, some of you that say, I just want to come back to the commitment I made and return, the Lord would be honored by that. and His grace reaches you where you are today. So today, as we think about this whole idea of being washed, perhaps there's someone here today that has never professed Jesus as the Lord of their life. You've never reached a point where you invited Him to come and be your Lord and your Savior. Maybe you have strayed away from that commitment, and you feel the Holy Spirit speaking to you as if it's just me and you in this room today, and the Spirit is making it plain to you, come back home. We invite you to come today and to share that decision because when we stand before a family of believers, there's accountability with that, and that accountability is so powerful. People that will pray for you, but people that will also hold you accountable to sticking with that, and we need that along the way as well. Maybe you come today wanting to join this church family. We'd welcome you with open arms. Whatever is the decision that the Spirit is leading you to make, find the courage to come and make that today as we offer this invitation to you today. Let's stand together. Rock of ages, clear for me, and let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flow be of sin the double cure, save from wrath. Nothing in my hand I bring, but simply to the cross I cling. Make it come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Fall I to the fountain fly, and wash me safe. While I draw this bleeding breath, when mine eyes shall close in death, and when I soar to worlds unknown, to see thee on thy judgment throne, O rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in be seated for just a moment, Perry. This is, this is uh, Angel Timmons, and uh, she's come up this morning. She said, I want to do that today. And I said, all right. She wants to make herself right, and uh, she wants to make that confession and be baptized today. And, and let's let her know that's a great idea. 
And it's a great time as we start off this new year to start off in a new life. And so I ask you to join hands with me and just repeat this great confession. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of Living God. The Son of Living God. And I accept him. And I accept him as my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. What a way to end end the service today. And I know there's a lot of uh, people rejoicing with those angels of heaven uh, today. It never gets old, does it? Yeah, it's good that you guys get to see this too. Leading the way, isn't she? That's your mom, I know. That's right. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, to, just want to take this minute while they're preparing for this baptism uh, to make you aware of a few things. Just remember that tonight we invite you back at 7. If you've been seeing that thermometer out there in the... Uh, lobby and knowing that we're paying down on something we are trying to pay down our debt load to a responsible level and maybe you wonder what's going on with the building program haven't heard anything about that in a while well tonight we want to bring you up to speed so if you'll come out tonight at seven we want to share we know not everybody is interested in hanging around to hear all about that this morning but if you are interested come back tonight we're going to ask the people that are here go out and talk about this and share uh, so it will answer any questions you might have. We want to hear your input and your thoughts. This is a decision that our elders are taking very, very seriously because it's not our money. It's the Lord's money, and we want to make sure we use it in a way that he would have us to use it, and we um, accomplish the most possible for his kingdom. So we want your input in that process. Uh, so that's tonight at 7. I know youth. Jacob, are you here? I saw you earlier. Upstairs. Jacob, anything for about youth tonight? 6.30? 6.30, what's on the menu? Should I come back early? <laughs> pizza. It'll be pizza tonight. Um, <laughs> my wife's out of town. I can't. I'd be the same way, brother. <laughs> we go to leagues when my wife's out of town. Um, but tonight at 6.30, come out for that. I know the children, they're taking a break from January to catch their breath from all the Christmas stuff. But then starting in February, uh, they'll be back to that. If you're wondering what I'm doing now, this is called stalling uh, for time, and so I am uh, purposely talking more than usual today, but I thank you for coming. If you are visiting with us today, uh, it was our intention to make you feel welcome. If we failed in that, please forgive us. We are very interested in you and hope that you felt at home today uh, and welcome, and we hope to see you again next week. Uh, the new year is a great time to start new habits and one of the best habits that you can do for your spiritual life is what you've done today by being in the Lord's house. Does going to church make you a, a Christian? It doesn't, uh, but it sure helps. It sure helps. And we live in a day and age when uh, people tend to say, I'm, I, I just need Jesus. I don't need the church. Uh, maybe on some technical level you could make a case. But I haven't seen too many thriving Christians that didn't choose to be a part of a body of believers. I know that I need the accountability you all give me, um, and I need the prayers that you all pray for me, the support that you all give me, and uh, I also need an opportunity to serve and to share my gifts and to, to bless you as well. And that's a beautiful thing that the Lord had in mind when he put his church together. They are ready, so I'm going to hush. confession and faith. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glad you got to see that example today, too. That's wonderful. Uh, if there's nothing else to remind each other of, let's stand together and be dismissed with a, a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the privilege of being here in, in your house to give thanks to you, Lord. As we, uh, as we sang earlier, Lord, we need you in every aspect of our lives. And Father, we've come today to say thanks for every blessing that you've given us. Lord, I pray that you were pleased with our worship. I pray that you were pleased... Uh, not because of the cleverness of anything we've done here today, Lord, but by the sincerity and the repentance of the hearts of the people that have gathered to worship you. Lord, help us to be servants. Help us to get over ourselves and to learn to, to serve others and to invest in other people's lives and to show people that they matter and to earn the right to lead spiritually, Lord. 
I pray that you'll forgive us where we fall short. Thank you for your grace and for new beginnings and fresh starts. And God, I thank you for your Holy Spirit that does within us what we can't do for ourselves. We love you, and it's in that confidence that we now leave this place. Although we the service has ended, Lord, our fellowship with you goes on. And may we be a light everywhere we go this week. Bring us back at the next point of time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.